EEX 281, Lecture 21, Backtracking and Branch and Bound, Spring 2020. On our cover photo here, we can see uh, a picture of a puzzle called N Queen. We'll discuss that later today. But uh, it's a problem that you can solve with backtracking. We'll see how that works. This isn't an actual solution to it. The goal of N Queens is to take a chess board of size N. Um, normally you think of chess boards as size eight, but this is a computer science problem, so we can set N to whatever we like. Um, in the physical world though, chess boards are size eight, size eight, and the goal is to place eight queens on the board in such a way that no queen th threatens another. And queens can move an infinite amount in horizontal, vertical, and diagonal directions. So this is nearly an end queen's placement for a board of size 8, but you see that the northwest and southeast corners, those queens placed there threaten one another. So this one doesn't quite work, but we'll figure out how to find those that do. And then we'll also take a look at a piece of code that shows that as well. Here's our outline. We're going to talk again about constraint satisfaction and optimization. Those were, remember the fundamental problem types that we knew we could always fall back on back, backtracking and branch and bound solutions for. Then we'll look at backtracking in particular. We'll see how the general form of it works. And the general form can be mixed around a little bit, but it always has the same elements. Then we'll look at N Queens, the problem, um, and how that solution works. After that, we'll talk about branch and bound and the traveling salesperson problem which will be particularly useful in Project 4. And then at the end, we wrap up with some code walking, and I'll uh, jump into the end queen's code and play around with it. Okay. We talked about types of problems, constraint satisfaction problems. The goal is to find a solution, which is really a collection of decisions or placements or whatever the problem description says, We've got to make some choices and then make sure that we haven't violated any of the rules. Can't walk through walls or spend more than we have or buy more than we can store or whatever the problem description involves. We've got some constraints and the goal is to figure out can we solve this problem without violating any constraints. Oftentimes these constraint satisfaction problems may have more than one solution. But very often, too, the goal is to figure out, is there a solution at all? As we look at N Queens later, we'll find a solution, and we'll also find all the solutions, just so we can do some statistics on the solutions uh, for that particular N. Some examples, of course, still sorting puzzles. Uh, recently got back into just wildly difficult Sudoku puzzles, and puzzles like that and magic squares and Latin squares, things like that where you're trying to put numbers in, in certain arrangements, those can all be solved by backtracking. You say, well, I put a one here, then I put a two there. Oh, that doesn't work. Well, what if I put a three there? You keep working. So that's the brute force way to solve those things. It wasn't really brute force, but <clears throat> uh, you probably need to do a, a little bit more logical approach on a, a difficult Sudoku puzzle. But you can, as I mentioned, with this setup, with a constraint satisfaction problem, there may be a more elegant solution, as in when I'm solving Sudoku problems, I'm looking to isolate and eliminate candidates. But if I weren't going to do that, I could just write a very basic backtracking problem that fills in a digit and tries to fill in the next digit and tries to fill in the next digit, and whenever it runs into a constraint violation, a number in the same row and column or same house or whatever, then you backtrack and try something new. Um, there's a lot of tests on the GRE in the analytical section. Um, a lot of questions on the analytical section of the GRE have constraint satisfaction problems in them. Optimization problems extend constraint satisfaction problems usually because no solution is worth anything if it's violated the rules. So as we try to, to find an optimal solution, we have to make sure that we first stay within the rules. So the fundamental underlying portion of a branch and bound system is a 
constraint satisfaction problem. Then we add the optimization bit, so we're maximizing or minimizing whatever quantity is important to the problem. So yeah, here we talked about this. Um, we can stop often when just any solution is found for constraint satisfaction, but if we stop early on optimization problems, we never know when we found the best solution, literally until we found all the solutions. Once we've had a chance to not necessarily examine all of the solutions, but as, as long as we've gotten a chance to make sure that we've not passed the best solution, which may mean we look at more than one solution. We don't always look at all the solutions in um, branch and bound, but we will have a chance to pass them. And by, by, by saying that, I mean like if we're getting close to a solution, we will have gone there, but if it seems to be not optimal, we'll say, okay, I realize that there's a solution there, but I also realize it's not going to be the best. So I know of this solution and I know it's not the best. So you have to look at every solution that might be the best and if that means you look at every solution, then it does. But if you got a way to rule out some solutions, you can't just say, well, I found one and I'm just going to go with that. I think that's the best. You have to systematically go through all of the solutions. You might not have to look at each one of them directly, but you do have to say, I recognize this is a solution and I also realize it's not as good as what I've got. So I've identified where the solution is, maybe without fully looking at it, but I know that it's there. All right, saw the slide earlier talking about we can always rely on a backtracking algorithm to solve a constraint satisfaction problem, and we can use branch and bound to solve optimization problems. So here is our general form, and we saw this in our graph coloring. We've got this recursive function, check node, in this case, and check node is just a simple way to discuss how I'm going to check decision nodes in the graph that is the solution of my problem. So check node here also calls check node. So once again, we've got this recursive function and we've got this recursion down here in some sort of loop, right? And what that loop represents here, obviously it's talking about adjacent nodes because we're talking about looking at states that are next to the current state in the graph. And the graph that I'm holding up here, air quotes around, is the decision structure around what choices we can make. So a graph might be, when I'm running through a maze, the intersections that are north, east, south, and west of me. Those would make up the nodes, and the hallways would make up the edges. Or if I was talking about coloring nodes, uh, coloring a map, and the, the nodes would be each particular, uh, each particular state and then the edges would be the borders in between them. So in every problem, I've got some concept of adjacency to the current position that I'm in. So this recursion of calling check node within a check node is always gonna be wrapped in some sort of iteration as well because that iteration represents, as I'm trying to extend my solution, I have to check all of the things nearby the solution. So that's what's going on there. The general form and as always with our recursive functions we've got to have our base case and that's the first thing that's gonna happen here you check to see if I'm done because if I'm not done then I might continue but if I'm done I need to get out so that's sort of the heart of the recursion right there if I'm done if V is a current the current V is a solution then write the solution or process the solution or whatever your problem dictates. Um, if I found a solution, uh, maybe I can do something with it here. However, if I haven't found a solution, then I recurse. And that recursion is wrapped in iteration because I'm gonna check all of the neighboring states to see if I can use one of those neighboring states to make my next advance in the solution. All right, outside of that, in this current structure, we're at a place where check node gets called with a particular vertex. And if it works its way through the function, its goal is to call check node again with another vertex. 
or sort of have, having extended the solution. So we'll try to just use this loop to extend the solution. And then as we go into check node, the first thing we do is run across this promising call. And this call to promising says, hey, you've just given me a partial solution. It could be a full solution. It could be a partial solution or a full solution. But whatever the solution you've just given me is, I want to know if it has violated any constraints. If it has violated a constraint, then it is not the way to a full solution. It means it is not promising. However, if I've got some full or partial solution that hasn't violated any constraints, that's promising, right? That's promising. All right, so that's the general form, and we're always going to be looking for sort of these three elements in backtracking. The first one is, hey, I've got a partial solution. Is it, is it legal? The second one is, here's a partial solution, is it actually a full solution, right? And the third element is, I've got to have this iteration around neighboring vertices or neighboring states to say, I'm going to try all of the states nearest to this state. So those are the three elements of every backtracking problem, and we saw how in the map coloring we use it in this exact structure with if promising wrapping everything and then solution check and the recursive call in there so we'll see uh n queens is going to have these three elements slightly remixed though so here's the three functions i talked about solution checking to see the depth of a solution as as we make a bunch of decisions so if i'm coloring my map state i can think of that starting as a tree at the top and every time I color a state, I can move myself down towards the bottom. And this decision tree says if I'm on this level and I color this state green, then I can move to the level below. Right? And so the depth there is representing in, in that particular problem, have I colored 10 states? When I get down to having a depth of 10, that means I've made these decisions along the way. I get down there at the bottom and that's when I get a solution. Promising, as we said yesterday, is going to be different for every application. Promising is just a direct applying of the constraints. Given the current solution offered or partial solution offered, does it violate any constraints? And then check note, of course, is the function that we're talking about. So in N Queens, I talked about it already. We've got a chessboard and n is the size of the chessboard. It's an n by n chessboard. And the question is, can you place n queens on that chessboard in such a way that no two queens threaten each other? So how about with n equal one? Well, that's trivially true because with one queen, there's no queens to threaten any other queens. No problem. How about two? If you look at the way a two by two chessboard is, um, there's no way that you can get away from another queen. They're either adjacent horizontally, adjacent vertically, or adjacent diagonally. And so uh, we're going to go with no on n equals 2. n equals 3. Also no. Play around with that one a little bit. Um, but if you've got any two in the same row or column, obviously we're blown here. And with the 3 by 3, there's no way to set up a diagonal in such a way that I, there's no way to set up three of them in such a way that they don't threaten each other diagonally. N equals four. Now here's where it begins. Yes, I can get two different ways of N equal four and I'll show you uh, those in just a minute, but um, it's possible. After we get to five and six and beyond, I, I think that it's, just keeps going. I don't know that it's been proven that it can exist for every n above 4, but I know that they don't start until you get really in earnest to 4. Anything beyond trivial. So we'll look at those in a bit. Let's just look at some complexity for starters, right? In the 8 queens search space, right, just the normal chessboard, if you were going to try to sit at home in your quarantine state, and figure out how can I do eight queens myself. You probably end up using pawns to do this because no chess set actually has eight queens. But if you take pawns and say these are all going to act like queens, how might I do this? Well, brute force 
is our first algorithm family from yesterday. And let's just try every single arrangement of any one of those queens. Well, you're never going to get finished, right? It's 1.7 times 10 to the 14th different possibilities. And um, luckily, though, for you, that would be sort of sort of like the monkey version of end queens. The monkey just tips the board over and throws pieces on there, and that's where they end up, right? So that 1.7 times 10 to the 14th has a bunch of ridiculous configurations. Like, what if I put all of them in the first row? Well, no, you wouldn't work that. If, as a human, you wouldn't do that. You would see that I've got two in the first row, and that's violating a constraint, and I would move on. You would prune before you did brute force. So if we said, let's be a little bit sensible about it then. Since I know that I can't have more than one queen in every row, column, and diagonal, as I start placing the queens, what if I just place one queen per row? That's decent. If I, it makes no sense if I do anything more than that. So if I get to just placing one queen per row, that cuts me down quite a bit. I still end up with about 16 million possibilities on my way to finding the 92 different solutions for eight queens. So, um, just not placing something, multiple items in the same row is a good start, but how can we further reduce this search space? Let's look at backtracking. So we start here. We're going to place a queen in the first row, and we're also going to do it in the first column, because that seems reasonable enough. We need some sort of deterministic way to get started here. So I'm going to just start in the, for the, the lowest available column and then sort of increment my way up as I work my way down the rows. So I start there and you see that um, as I go to the next row, if I were to place a queen in this first position, I would violate a constraint. All right, so let's backtrack. Not in the first position. Let's try it in the second position. All right, that violates a constraint as well. So let's backtrack and try it in the third position. All right, those two are threatened. Then as I place there, I see that this is now promising because I've placed a new queen and none of the queens threaten each other, so no constraint is violated. The next placement is to, to extend the solution forward, this is me working my way down the depth of the decision tree. I'm trying to place four queens. When I've got to a depth of four, then I will have a solution if it's promising, right? So next placement in the third row, I say, well, that queen is threatened here. If I place it in the second column, it's threatened by the second row queen. Third column, threatened by the second row queen. And the fourth column is also threatened by the second row queen. So there's no way for me to place a queen in the third row given my current placements. So what do I do? I backtrack. I say if there's no way to advance the solution, we go back a step and try to change the partial solution. Right? Backtrack to row three and I'm going to try placing my queen now in the fourth column. Excellent. Now I'll try to move forward again. I see that in the third row, first column, still threatened by queen in the first row. But in the third row, second column, I've got a free space. Let's put a queen there. Promising check says, yes, you've placed three queens. No queens threaten each other. You can move on. Excellent. Trying to place in the fourth row, I see... Column 1 threatened by queens from rows 1 and 3. Column 2 is threatened by queens in rows 2 and 3. Column 3 is threatened by the queen in row 3. And column 4 is threatened by the queen in row rows 2 and 3. So there's nothing I can do there, so I would backtrack. As I backtrack, what happens? I end up backtracking all the way to row one because as I backtrack just one simple row, I say, what if I move the third row queen into the third column? I see that's threatened here by the second row queen. Putting the third row queen in the fourth column is still threatened by that second row queen. So there's no way to advance in the third row. So I backtrack to the second row. I've already tried everything in the second row. 
So there's no way to advance with that second row placement. I have to backtrack to the first row and try a new first row position. All right. That's how backtracking works. We'll get to the actual solution in a minute. As we look at this constraint satisfaction, we could require one solution. We could require several solutions. Or we could require all the solutions. We'll see a nice piece of code that does generate all of them and lets us run some statistics. It'll tell us how many were found for every n, and it's pretty fun. <clears throat> so the specific form, remember, of any backtracking solution is going to have its very own solution function. This is how we check to see if we have included all of the things. And then it's also going to have its very own uh, promising check. So we'll have to look at both of those. Here's how promising is going to be set up for n queens. Promising is going to be set up with row and col. So I'm going to imagine that I'm trying to place a queen in a particular row and column. And the promising check is going to say, if you place the queen in this row or col row and column, it's either violating a constraint or not. If I place a queen in this row and column with the current state of the board and it doesn't violate constraints, then promising is going to return true, meaning I can advance the solution. If I try to place a queen in a row column and it violates a constraint, as in there's something else in that row column or, or diagonal, then it's going to return false and I have to not try to advance the solution through that placement. All right. So we're going to do this with some data structures here. You might think this is a two-dimensional board. Give me some two-dimensional vector and let's go. You could do that. It's going to end up a lot more challenging than this particular uh, interesting solution that we have. So we're going to do this with a four 1D structures. Sorry. Instead of having this 2D, one 2D structure, I'm going to do this with four 1D structures. All right. So... I've got first this 1D vector of booleans that tells me whether or not a column is available. Right? Then I've got a 1D vector of booleans called left diagonal, which allows me to check if I'm threatened from moving upper left to lower right. And then I've got right diagonal, which tells me whether I'm threatened from moving upper right to lower left. That's going to be pretty interesting. Last but not least, I'm going to have a 1D vector of integers that tell me where my placement in any particular row is. All right? So we end up, when we're doing this promising check, as I say, here's my row and column. Is that particular placement promising? Well, if there's already something in that column, it's definitely not, it's definitely not promising. And since we know we're only placing one thing in each row, that's a check that I don't have to make. So I'm just going to be using these three Boolean uh, vectors to do my checks. And I'm going to keep one more vector of integers to keep track of my results. All right. So then this left diagonal X and Y is a little bit more challenging. We have to figure out how row and col relate to checking a particular left diagonal X or a right diagonal Y. As we look at n queens, let's roll this back to just four queens. So with four queens, I end up with a tree that has 256 leaves. How does that work, right? As I'm trying to place one queen, I start out at the top and I get to a decision depth here of four. That's putting something in, uh, you know, columns zero, one, two, or three. Once that queen's placed, I can go down to placing Q2. And Q2 has the same decision tree with, you know, columns 0, 1, 2, and 3. And I move down from there. This is where I would place Q3. And each one of those I move down and place Q4. So if I were to fill in all of the four branches on every single node, what I would have along the bottom here would be 256 different ways that I could get to the bottom. Some of those obviously would be constraint violations. Like if I've got more than two of them that have column zero, that's a constraint violation. That's great. 
I can prune that. I'm going to be able to prune that. It's pretty nice. Backtracking actually is going to make this 256 leaves that I have at the bottom turn into me searching 19 branches before I find a solution. So from 256 down to 19 is pretty good. So here's our search tree in N Queens. Oh, come back to me here. There we go. Let's take the board of uh, N Queens 4x4. Four four. And it looks like that. And what I'm going to do to simplify this, instead of having to deal with row and column, is I'm just going to give every cell a name. And then you can refer to those cells directly with a single character. All right, so there's my board. And what I start out by doing is let's place something in the first row. We start out with A. A sounds good. Is that good? Nothing violated there, so we'll try the next. To tr we'll try to extend the solution here. So we go into the next row, row two, and I'll start right at the beginning and say E. E is clearly a constraint violation because now I've got two in the same column. So I'll try an adjacent state. An adjacent state is one where I've already got A and I'm iterating through my choices at the next level. So iterating through my choices at the next level means I'm going to keep A and try E, F, G, and H. That's what the loop around the recursion does for me, right? So as I realize A, E is a violation, I'm going to try A, F. AF threaten each other diagonally, so that's a violation, right? So I'll try AG. AG is valid, right? We already saw this on the previous slide when we were looking at uh, Qs and Xs, right? So AG, we know that's good, and I try then to investigate the solutions around AG, which means I'm going to iterate through all of the choices in the third row. A-G-I, that's going to be threatened by A. I'll play A-G-J, J is threatened by G, A-G-K, threatened by G, A-G-L, threatened by G. So there's no way to advance that solution with A and G. Now as I've fallen out of a level of recursion, right, I'm, I'm down doing an iteration at the sort of third placement level, and it's failed all the way across the board literally. So then I'm going to go back and try to iterate at this second level and try to finish the iteration where I'm at. So then I come back here and I say, well, there's H. A, H, no threatening going on. We're good. Let's try to extend the solution. We extend the solution by iterating through the things again in the third row. A, H, I. I still threatened by A. A, H, J. No threats. We've now got a solution that's three levels deep and is still promising. It goes A, sorry, I didn't cross this out. It goes A, H, I, A, H, J, I can read. Okay, so I try to extend the solution from J, and that means I'm going to iterate through all of my options in the fourth row because the fourth row is the one that's adjacent to the third row. So from A, H, J, I'm going to jump to A, H, J, M. And we see that M is threatened by both A and J, so that's out. N is threatened by both J and H, so that's out. O is threatened by J, that's out. P is threatened by J, uh, sorry, A and H, so that's out. Which means there's no way that I can advance the AHJ solution. So then I'll try AHK. We see that AHK has K threatening H, H threatening K, vice versa, and AHL is the last thing I can do there, and H and L, of course, threaten each other. So that's out, and now I've tried everything underneath H. With no success, then it means that I have to backtrack, and I end up backtracking all the way to the first level because everything at the second level has failed when A is placed in, when A is placed. So that, so I'm going to backtrack here and try B at the first level. All right. So B, E comes up. B threatens E. B threatens F. 
B threatens G. BH. No threats going on there. So we'll try BH I. I is clear. It's not threatened by B or H. So I can move forward again. Right? How about B H I M? Because now I'm trying to iterate through the fourth row. Ah, come back. Through the fourth row. B H I M. Well, I and M are threatening each other, so that's out. B H I N. You can see here that I and N are diagonally adjacent, so that's out. As well as being diagonally adjacent to uh, H. And then I come up to B H. I O. There I find a solution. Just to uh, reiterate that, I'm going to color those in for you. Right? So B H I O looks like B H I O. Nothing in the same rows, nothing in the same columns, and no two queens are diagonally adjacent. So there is one of my four queens solutions. And the number of these dead ends that I ran into, this is where I'm talking about, I end up going through 19 different choices before I find a solution. And BHIO is one solution, and if you're astute, you can figure out that the other solution is just the mirror image of the one that I'm currently viewing here. So that would look something like C E L N. So there are my two solutions for end queens. If I were to continue this backtracking situation, I could sort of tail off at one solution right there and then roll back to say, well, what if I keep going? If I backtrack again to my first level and I would then pick C as my starter and C would then walk me forward through C, E, L, N and I would find that next solution quite quickly after the first one in this particular instance. All right. So backtracking allows me to prune these branches that are not promising. All of the backtracking algorithms that we'll see are going to have some similar form. Um, it's going to be a remix of those three things I talked about being important. Solution, promising, and how do I advance my current partial solution, which is going to involve the recursive call wrapped around some iteration of all of the choices that are still available at that level. The hardest part usually is just coming up with what does this promising function mean? How do, I, how do I calculate whether or not this new test is promising? It's pretty easy because it's almost brute force-ish force how I pick the next solution. I'm just going to iterate through all of the things that are available. And that's where we've got that systematic attempt of all of the options. It comes from there's that brute force aspect of it. It's, it's pretty easy to come up with the next permutation. It's often harder to come up with whether or not it's promising. All right, back to this end queens implementation. We know that each row is going to have exactly one queen, each column, and each diagonal has one. So we're going to take this chessboard and model it instead of as a 2D array. I'm going to use four 1D arrays. One of those arrays has integers in it to tell me which column I'm placing in a particular row. That's my row vector. And then I've got a column vector, which is a bunch of bools, and two diagonal vectors, which are also a bunch of bools. All right? You can take this and look at the code later, and you'll see how it extends this to any size n. So here's our solution. We see it now. We see that in order to find the solution, this is my, this is my row vector right here, and it shows what my values are in each of the rows, right? In row 0, I'm in column 1. In row 2, I'm in column 3. And sorry, in row 1, I'm in column 3. In row 2, I'm in column 0. And then here in uh, row 3, I'm in column 2. All right, all 0 index, lots of fun. So far, so good. So that's what one of my first, this is my 1D vector that has integers in it. This is what my 1D vector of Booleans for column availability looks like. It's just got one cell for every column and it tells me whether or not that column is available. See here in this first column, there's no queens. 
that means true it's available there's a queen here in the second column that means it is not available all right this column here index 2 is available because there's no queens in it and finally the last column has a queen in it so it is not available so there we go now how about these diagonals there's more diagonals than there are rows or columns so in this case I've got seven left diagonals and you see that my left diagonals are the ones that sort of go from high in the northeast to low in the southwest or vice versa there so if I look at this board you can see these sort of magenta lines that are drawn across the diagonals there's my first diagonal and you can see that there's no piece there so no queen says that diagonal is available my second diagonal here has a queen on it so that's why it's marked as false not available I've got two empty diagonals true true then a false diagonal and then two empty diagonals that wrap it up so I find this index um, by adding the row and column together and that's what's going to tell me which diagonal I'm on right here so if I think of this as 0 1 2 3 0 1 2 3 if I figure out where this queen here on the top is right this queen on the top is at row 0 column 1 so it should be index 1 and sure enough that's where the false shows up over here what about this queen this queen is in row 1 column 3 adding 1 and 3 together says I should be definitely having false availability in the diagonal that's index 4 this row 1 plus column 3 4 and I check here I look at 0 1 2 3 4 and sure enough that's how it is so it's easy to come up with my diagonal from row and column for my left diagonal I just add those two things together five and six all right how about my right diagonal right diagonal is just the mirror image of those left diagonals we got to do slightly different math but the concepts are the same I'm gonna start here in this upper right hand corner when I started counting my uh, diagonals I started in the upper left hand corner for the left diagonals and I'm gonna go from the upper right hand corner for my right diagonals so this is the one that's at zero here's one here's two here's three four five and six so as you see that I've got availability in zero I've got no availability in one and two that's what these two falses are and then from my west of the rest of the way down there three four five and six those are all available so how do I calculate the index by taking any particular row and column I take it and say row minus column which clearly could give me a negative number but if I add to that n minus one that's sort of a modular arithmetic thing that gets me wrapped around to the other side of things so just as before if I look at this as columns 0 1 2 and 3 sorry rows 0 1 2 and 3 columns 0 1 2 and 3 I can add them up 1 plus 3 here would be how I found that in the left diagonal but to find it in the right diagonal I'm going to say 1 minus 3 1 minus 3 gives me a negative number that's never going to work so that's a negative 2 but since I'm going to add 3 to it that's n minus 1 n is 4 minus 1 is 3 add that to my negative 2 I end up with this is diagonal index 1 so if I sort of number my diagonals you can see that this is index 0 index 1 index 2 index 3 4 5 and 6 all right so that's what the solution uses and it then becomes pretty easy as I say hey I'm trying to place a queen at this row and column is that promising so well first I can just check the column availability matrix if that column has got a false in it then false this is not a promising placement there's already someone in that column right and she's not happy about it not happy about you joining all right next up I check my left diagonal check my right diagonal with these index calculations and if there's bool availability I know that I'm good to go I place the queen there and I go back and I'm gonna mark those columns as no the column and diagonals as no longer being available so I look to see a true in those three vectors and then as I do the placement if I've got three trues I go back and mark all three of them as false because now no one else can use those column or diagonals so here is my promising function now it seemed a lot more complicated when you probably thought about this in a two-dimensional way but now this collection of three one-dimensional 
simple questions. Is the column available? Is the diagonal available? Is the other diagonal available? I can just return the conjunction of all of that, right? Perfect. If column is available and diagonal is available and right diagonal is available, left diagonal and right diagonal are available, then it's promising. That's it. So here is put queens. This is my backtracking function because the goal is to put the queens on the board. So we've called this put queen and what we're doing is we're trying to put a queen in a particular row. All right, we say we've just put a queen in row something or other. So you start out obviously calling this function with a zero so that we can try to put a queen in the zeroth row, the first row. First thing we need to do is check for a solution. If row is equal to n, then hey, we've found a solution. Right? If we're trying to put queen in row 4, and since we're using zero-based indexing, if we say, I'm trying to put a queen in row 4, or index 4, then that's a time to quit. Right? There we know that row is equal to n, we found a solution, and we can stop trying to advance. So this simple version just says that a solution is found, and that means that there's a way to do it. It doesn't tell you what the solution is, but I mentioned earlier that constraint satisfaction is just about oftentimes just finding if a way to do this exists. All right, so then let's go see if we can sort of identify our elements, right? I talked about a call to promising, all right? There's my call to promising in line nine. I talked about a solution check. There it is in line three. If row is equal to n, I've placed all the queens and in this case, since um, we're doing this, I talked about this slightly remixed, I'm doing my promising check inside of my adjacency loop check. But what that means is, if I get something that's promising, it lets me advance. So then, in this particular remix, the first thing that I can check for is, am I done? Whereas before, in the other version that we illustrated, we were checking to see if we hadn't violated any constraints. Here, we don't extend it. We don't even say this is a solution for worth checking unless we know that it's not promising, unless we know that it's promising, hasn't violated any constraints. So there's two of the things that I want. And then the last thing that I want is me trying to advance the solution inside of some loop that tries all of the adjacent choices there, right? So here's my loop and these two things together are my three elements. My three elements being solution, uh, spell it. Three elements being solution and promising and three, I've got this iterated extension of the solution. So here they are, like I mentioned, in a slightly different order, but they're all there and let's see how it works. So here I'm trying to look for every column available, and I know that this call is moving myself forward in rows. So every time I get to a new row, I'm going to call put queen again. So this is how I iterate through rows by making new calls to queen, to put queen. That's the recursive stuff, but it's still moving me through the rows. And then inside of each row, I'm going to iterate through all of the columns and try to place something in each one of those columns. So this way, you can see that I go through every row and column as an attempt to place a queen there, right? Here is my attempt to put a queen in that row, and that put a queen in a row is only going to happen when I know that it's promising. So my check then says, if I'm in row 0, is placing a queen in row 0, column 0, promising? Of course, in the beginning it will be. But then, every time I move forward, I'm in either a new column because of the for loop, or I'm in a new row because of the call, uh, a new call to put queen. So far, so good. Last up is the bookkeeping. There's bookkeeping to be done. We've got to maintain our state so that we can continue to know what we've done so far and what we can and can't do going forward. So I've got those three vectors that I talked about that were my Boolean vectors telling me what's available right here. And I've got my column check. Let's clean this up a little bit. It's not the easiest to read with. 
arrows. So, you see that I've determined that in line 9 that this current attempt is going to be promising. I don't come inside the conditional at 9 to hit lines 11 through 20 unless this is promising. If it's promising, that means that the column and both the diagonals are available. What I want to do to move forward is say, okay, let's put a queen there, but make sure that the, those column and diagonals are no longer available. So I go through here and say, I'm going to put the item in this row, in that column, so this is me putting a number in my number vector, then I say the column is no longer available, the diagonal is not available, the right diagonal also not available. Left diagonal and right diagonal is marked not available for that row and column combination. Then I put the queen in that row and try to advance the solution because this is my recursive call to say move down to the next row. When I move down to the next row, I'm going to show up in my column left and right diagonal vectors are going to be saying, here's what's available. When I finish that, right, after I've tried to put the queen in the next row, I'm going to remove the queen from the current row. So you see here the bookkeeping says, make it marked as unavailable because I just put a queen there and now I'm extending the solution. Once I'm done trying to extend the solution though, I come back in the recursion and I say, okay, well, now that I'm done trying that, I'm going to remove this thing that I placed there. I put a queen to see if I could move the solution forward. Now, whether I could or whether I couldn't, I'm backtracking and I'm going to remove the queen. So at the end of this entire function call, what I'm going to end up with is the solution found as a set of integers in this position in row vector. And when the function finally exits at the very end, if I've tried all of the options, my column and left and right diagonal availability vectors will all be marked as true because you'll have placed all the queens and removed the queens and you leave the board as you found it. Empty, waiting for the next person maybe to come do their own solution. So that's what we always have sort of this concept of make an attempt here which involves marking something up to say this is no longer available you can't do this we've got something here so we know that if in map coloring for instance I say if I try coloring this state green great and I can move forward when I backtrack I say I'm not gonna make this state green now I'm gonna uncolor that green so every time I write something here I've got to unwrite it afterwards there so that's what you're gonna see in your backtracking solutions as we're trying to move our solution forward we're gonna mark something as used and then we're going to unmark it. All right? All right. Well, as, as I mentioned, we're going to look at this in code uh, in just a few minutes here. Right now, let's talk about the traveling salesperson problem. This is another one that's going to be big here. It's coming up. It's part C. Well, it's all of this project uh, four has got to do with um, traveling salesperson problem. So, this is a nice Randall Cunningham here. If you haven't seen uh, Randall Cunningham, wow, football. Randall Monroe, sorry. XKCD, wonderful comic. You should check it out. It's brilliant. It's funny. It's uh, extremely nerdy, but it's a lot of fun. So, talks about solving the traveling salesperson problem. And the high level on the traveling salesperson problem is you're a person who sells for a living. And when you're traveling, you're not selling. So the goal is to go to the places that you need to sell with the least amount of travel time spent and any time you would imagine revisiting a city that you've already been to is not going to be productive. So we want to make a path that gets me through all of the cities I wish to sell at without ever returning to a city other than my home. I want to end up at home. I travel, I sell, I come back home. So I never want to double up at a city unless it's the end of the trip and it's home. And I want to take the shortest possible path. So I don't want to keep crisscrossing the country from east coast to west coast. I'd rather go down one coast, cross the middle of the country, go up the other coast and come back in a really simplified version. But um, you can see here, this is an example of it. You see a nice drawing of someone trying to figure out the traveling salesperson this is the person here that's trying to sell. We know that the brute force solution is just going to be n factorial. That's painful. n factorial takes a long time with any reasonable n. 
Um, the best DP algorithms look like something that's n squared times 2 to the n, which is still not polynomial, right? n squared times 2 to the n, that's really slow. Or if you wanted to keep this in constant time, you could just visit your desk and sell things on eBay. So um, this is the, the comedy that is XKCD. What's also worth noting here is this this ultimal uh, this optimal solution, this DP solution that has this n squared is called a splitting planes solution, and you would split the plane here. So it kind of looks like the comic was drawn with pains as an accident, but it really wasn't. That's what I'm talking about. The real smartness of this comic is it even has the actual solution drawn into a joke, and that's pretty impressive. All right, so definitions to get this started, we've got the Hamiltonian cycle. Given a graph G, find a cycle, meaning start at one location, return to that location, <clears throat> and make sure that it traverses each node in the graph exactly once, other than the return location. The traveling salesperson problem then is, let's get a Hamiltonian cycle with the least weight. So if you're paying attention, you can say, hey, this is constraint satisfaction. But what I'm trying to do is visit all the cities. <clears throat> but not just in any particular not just in any way, in a particular way. <coughs> Excuse me. Start at one city, end at the same city. Never visit any city twice. There's my constraints. Visit all the cities, no duplicates, return home. <clears throat> And then what is TSP? TSP is an optimization of that. Find the shortest path. Branch and bound or BNB is going to take backtracking and extend it to optimization problems. And we do this by minimizing this function with a useful property. So I know that a partial solution is pruned if it ever violates a constraint. But now with branch and bound, I'm going to add a partial solution being prunable if it looks like it's going to cost too much. If I've got a, a, an existing solution and I know that I'm trying to find the best, if my current solution isn't going to be better than that, it's not a solution worth investigating. <clears throat> so if the cost of the partial solution is going to lead to a complete solution that is too expensive, and we're going to drop that partial solution. That's an additional way to prune. So now I get to prune by checking for constraint violations, and I get to prune by making sure that I keep something minimal or maximal, depending on whichever version of branch and bound you're trying to do. In this case, TSP, we're definitely minimizing our distance. The efficiency of BNB is always based on bounding a away like how much can I prune the more I can prune the more efficient my algorithm is the earlier I know that I've got a fail the earlier I prune and the more of the decision tree I cut out so we saw when we were looking at the n queens uh, the four queens version we said there was 256 different leaf nodes at the bottom of that when I found out that two queens at the top were next to each other that cut out a quarter of that 256 uh, the, ne the next level remaining. So I was able to cut out quite a bit there. The earlier I can prune, the sooner I know things are going to go away. The more I can cut out. And the more accurately I can prune, the better off I am as well. Because it turns out if I don't prune enough, I end up with a really large search space and it takes a long time. But if I prune too much, I could potentially cut out the optimal answer and then I still don't find the optimal answer. So my pruning can't be just wild, it has to be as accurate as possible. The more accurate it is, the faster I get. So it's often worth spending more time to calculate better bounds because what I'm trying to do is avoid that brute force approach, right? I'm trying to avoid this n factorial work by pruning and so the more I can prune, the farther away I get from n factorial. Which means if I'm going to take some time to do that, I definitely would spend linear time to prevent doing factorial work. 
I would spend quadratic time to prevent doing factorial work. I would even spend cubic time without batting an eye if it allowed me to prevent doing factorial work. Right? So that's what it's saying here. It's worth spending extra effort to compute better bounds. And so far in 281, we've been just dying on complexity here. And how can I make this simpler? And I've got to make that shorter. And you're going to come up against things in P4 where you just can't believe that it's okay to do that because it's quadratic or you're doing things that are not optimal, but what feels like it's not optimal. It seems like it's optional. It's sure it's optional. And if I choose to do something that's n squared plus n squared, that I would rather not do that much work in projects one, two, and three. But if me doing quadratic work prevents me from doing factorial work in project four, it's all good. So here's my example of TSP. I'm going to find a tour of minimum length, starting and ending at the same city, and visiting every city exactly once. With this simple version, I like to just do the human eye test to figure out what this is going to be. I see I've got these six points. I've got some version of moving my way around, and I've got to get back inside and back out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have one of these edges on the outside cut out so that I can sort of jog into the middle and then back out. So one of these edges is going to be removed. A quick examination says if I've got to remove one external edge, Let's have it be that one. Let's have it be the one that costs the most, the nine. So my ultimate solution is probably going to look like that. All right. We know that. We can go back and verify that with a little bit of math, but there's no adding that nine in and removing the nine that's going to make this better. Here, if I subtract the nine, I'll add four and eight. Here I'm subtracting 9 and adding 5 and 4, so I'm getting a net 0. Here to remove this edge, I'd have a net positive 7. To remove this edge, I'd have remove 2, add 15, and net positive 13. If I remove this one and add those 12, I'm going to get a net positive 11, and this is going to give me a net positive 7. So this one is a net positive 0, so that's definitely the edge I'm going to remove. In the end, that's the solution I'm looking for. <laughs> All right. TSP, give a little bit of history on the TSP. It's a, an NP hard problem, meaning we don't really have a polynomial solution to this, and we're not sure that uh, we can ever find one, right? Well, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. We know that this one is, is NP, right? It's non-polynomial solution here. In 1954... Uh, the state of the art, because of the computers they had at the time, you could calculate one of size 49. That is uh, not very many points, but 1954 computers weren't that special either. All right. 2004, here's a solution of Sweden. This is a bunch of cities in Sweden, and it's able to do. 24,000, almost 25,000 cities in a TSP tour. And this took hundreds and hundreds of compute hours. It was even done with multiple machines. For P4, you've got 30 seconds in one computer. All right. That's why our number is looking more like 1954 on the auto grader than uh, this one right here. So, and this is for optimal TSP, right? This is the optimal TSP. When you do fast TSP, we can certainly calculate uh, something of this size, but we know that it's not optimal. It's just an, a close approximation. So TSP is really backtracking, right? I can find this with backtracking. I say, well, let's try this and let's try that. If that doesn't look good, I'll go back, right? So here, as I just try to figure out a path that gets me there without violating any constraints, you can see that I've got this decision tree. I can start at A, then move to B, then move to C, then move to D, E, F, and then A, right? So A through B, C, D, E, F, and A looks like that. Backtracking is going to find these paths for me. So you can see here, I run into a constraint violation here. If I go A, B, C, F, E, D, right? So A, B, C, 
F E D ends up me having hit all six of the cities, but I don't end up at home. So that's a violated constraint. I see another set of violated constraints here. If I go A B C D, I'm sorry, A B F D, I'm stuck either way, right? So A B start up at the top A B F D. Now I'm stuck with having to go to E and not being able to reach C or having to go to C and not being able to reach E. So that's what I see these X's in the graph here. And you can see that I work my way all the way down to the bottom of them and I can find out what my optimal solution is. I can see the smallest value here that hasn't violated a constraint is one of these two twenties. All right. So in the end, I can add those edges up. That's five and four and five and two and one and three there is my 20 <clears throat> great so with backtracking I can find all the solutions and it would be this search space here ends up being n factorial I'm gonna look at a bunch of things here I do get to do some pruning but I would be doing n factorial work here for sure so I'm gonna add this bound that's the key to branch and bound is the bound part the bound says if it looks like this is expensive or too expensive, let's say no there. So one way to do this is to start with an infinity bound. If I've got no solutions whatsoever, if I've got no prior knowledge about a problem that I'm solving with branch and bound, I have to start with an infinity bound, meaning any solution that I get is going to be good enough. Because with no solution, even a terrible solution is better than no solution. So we'll start with an infinity bound. And so as I'm working, I say, if this looks like it's going to end up better than infinity, I'll keep trying it. Great. So then that's the part of it before I've got a, an initial sort of offering there. When I'm using the infinity bound, then I am purely just doing backtracking. So I'm trying to figure out, is there a solution? Remember, backtracking is really good at just finding out whether or not a solution exists. Once I find a solution, I'm going to say, well, that's better than infinity. I've calculated the length of the solution or the cost of the solution or the weight of the solution, whatever your problem is. I've calculated a solution. Now I'm going to continue to look for more solutions. And any solution that's not better than the solution I've got isn't worth anything. So I'm going to throw that away. So I'm going to take my first complete solution and say, this is my new bound. And we're going to call this an upper bound because what I don't want to do is I don't want to spend anything more than what I've already got. The best I've seen so far is my new upper bound. Going beyond the best I've seen so far, so far is a waste of time because I'm trying to minimize. So if any other solution that I come up with ends up cheaper than my upper bound, then I say, well, great, I found a cheaper solution. I'm going to lower my upper bound and continue to search for solutions. I keep going that way on and on. Every time I find a shorter solution, I add that as my upper bound and I look for more solutions until I can't find any solutions. And then what I'm left with is the upper bound is my best solution. That's my minimum path. All right. So that's what we've got to do. We're going to figure that out. <clears throat> it involves, uh, unfortunately, a little bit of magic in this particular example. Right. And this magic takes the form of me having some function that I can say, if I've got a partial path, what's the remaining path going to cost me without me doing the remaining factorial work? Can you just tell me what it would cost? And that's where the magic kicks in because there's no perfectly accurate function that can give you this factorial answer without doing factorial work. So for the purpose of the slide, I've got a magic function that doesn't take factorial work, but it is factorial accurate. All right. So I'll start out and just go a b c d f a a b c d e f a and right that gets me from the top all the way down here i say well i can get back home with a 27 so now i'm looking for any solution that's going to be cheaper than 27 all right so i try my next one I say a b c d f if you go back and add those up a b c d f adds adds up to 23 and then I'm going to take this magic function and say, well, I don't, without checking to see all of what's left, give me an estimation of what's left. And it's going to say, well, the estimation of what's left, if I go from A, B, C, D, F, I've got to get then through E and back to A, and that's going to cost you about 8. Great. So then I can say, well, I know that this cost me 23 to get to F, 
And if the remaining work is 8 more, that's going to be a 31, which is greater than 27. So I can prune now. This isn't going to be any good. This 23 plus my magic function 8 says that's going to be more than 31. I'm done. All right, so we prune that F, which means I've tried all of the decisions after A, B, C, D. So then I can backtrack even further to A, B, C and try something new after A, B, C. After A, B, C comes A, B, C, F. And I can see that the, the weight of A, B, C, F is 22. My magic function that tells me how do I get through E and D and end up at A from F is going to cost me 9 more. 22 and 9 is another 31. Also not cheaper than 27, so I can prune that one right away. So that means I've tried all of my legal non-constraint violating options but below A, B, C. So then C, I'm going to backtrack from C and try what about A, B, F? ABF leads me down another set of paths. ABFC gives me a 21, and I estimate the rest of the work is 6. 21 plus 6 is 27, not less than the 27 I already have. And since I'm trying to find an optimal one, there's no sense doing work on something that's just going to be equally optimal. So what I'm looking for to not be pruned is you have to be better than the best so far. So 21, 6, 20, 21 plus 6 is not better than the best so far. It's just equal to the best so far. So I'm still going to prune it. All right. So I got a question about how do we predict that? Well, the prediction is, like I said, is going to be magic in this example. And it's going to be the hard part of how you solve things in any other branch and bound problem. The hard part is trying to figure out what a good estimation is. And that's where... The, the the guessing comes in here. It's not going to be real guess, but we can see some real dead ends. Those all show up there. Then as I come up with this new partial solution, A, E, D, C, B, F, A, there's a solution cost of 20. I'm going to lower my upper bound. I'm going to bring my upper bound down because I'm trying to minimize. And when I get done, my upper bound is my solution. So I'm going to going to lower my upper bound and say, now I've found a solution that's 20. Anything that isn't better than 20 isn't worth it. So now even if I find a 26, which would have been great a minute ago, not even a 26 or a 24 is good enough. I'm going to have to beat 20 to continue here. So here I see A, E, D, C, F for 14. Estimating the rest is going to be 10. That's 24. would have been great before I found this 20, but now it just gets pruned. A, E, D, F is an... 11 plus 9, 20, not an improvement, still pruned, pruned, pruned. So now I end up looking at far fewer leaf nodes before I found the answer here. So here you see I ended up looking at, um, what was it, uh, seven, ten different F7 leaf nodes before I was able to know that I had the best solution because that was backtracking. I had to find them all and then pick the smallest one. With branch and bound, though, I'm able to get to, in this case, just two F7 leaf solutions. Say, well, I found a 27, which was good, and then I found a 20, and nothing beat that. There's my optimal solution. All right. Here's the note about the magic. You usually don't have this perfect min cost value function that gets things done in constant time and prevents you from doing factorial work. Because if we had a magic function that worked like that, then all of our algorithms would just be constant time algorithms. You just say, I'm going to use the magic. So we're going to have to find a different way to do this. Some of the vertices connected so far, some are not. So what we're trying to do is figure out for only the unvisited vertices, how can I connect them with the lowest possible cost? Oh, it's a lawn day at my house, so not anything I can do about that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, nifty. All right, so as I'm trying to figure out my vertices that aren't in the path, so that's what I'm saying here. As I'm working my way through here, I've got A, B, F, C, for instance. I can say that A, B, F, C are a partial path. 
I actually know what they are. I've chosen them in that order, and their weight is 21. So that's something I know. What I don't know is how to connect everything else. That is D, E, and a return to A. So D and E are what are my estimate here. So I'm going to try to figure out how to estimate that. And one of the things I'm going to have to do to connect D and E to my current path and get me back home is connect D to E. Right? That's pretty simple. There's an edge between them. I just do that. When I'm talking about more vertices that aren't connected, though, say I'm trying to figure out if A, B is a good start. Then what I have to figure out is, well, what do I do with C, D, E, and F, which aren't connected? Well, first, let's get them connected to each other. Because I can find that. If I can find uh, an estimate that gets that done as cheaply as possible, that might be on the way to my solution. So... For my unvisited vertices, I'm going to try to con connect them together with the lowest possible cost. Then if I connect them back to my current existing path, I've got a chance, right? So, what I'm going to do is not worry about violating constraints because this magic function now is not going to be as exact as it was on the previous slide. Now it's going to be an estimation. And we're going to call this estimation the lower bound. The branch and bound has an upper bound which is the best I've seen so far, and a lower bound. And that lower bound is saying, if these are my options that are remaining, what is the absolute cheapest I can connect them with? All right? Because I've got a partial path and some unconnected vertices. So the partial path I can measure absolutely, and then I estimate what's remaining. And if the measured partial path plus the estimate is too expensive, then I want to prune it. And so what I want my estimate to be is a lower bound. I want my estimate to be as cheap as possible, right? In reality, connecting it might cost more, but if it costs less, that's okay. Because if it costs more, how do I use that, right? If my estimate is as minimal as possible and I add that to my current and it's too long, then I'm throwing it away anyways. So if my estimate is wrong and it's wrong short, that's okay. Because if it's wrong short and I decide adding it isn't worth it, then being right is just too long anyway. So that's where I say here that this approach with connecting all of the possible vertices here, you might be thinking, how can I connect some vertices at the lowest possible cost? If I had Jeopardy, I'd play the sound right now. So you're thinking about how do I connect these vertices with the lowest possible cost? That's a spanning tree, isn't it? I need them all connected with the lowest possible cost. It's a minimal spanning tree. So if I connect these things in a minimal spanning tree format, you say, well, that isn't necessarily a Hamiltonian cycle. And I say, yes, you are correct. But if I were to connect them in a Hamiltonian cycle, it would be longer. It would definitely be no shorter than the MST. So if the MST violates constraints and gives me a path that's short, but still isn't short enough, that I don't care that turning it into a a non-constraint violating path would be even longer because at its very best, it's not good enough. This is why we say our estimate must always be less than or equal to reality. So this estimate function must be less than or equal to reality because if it's too long, I'm going to throw it away. And if the reality is even longer, then I would have thrown it away when it was too long as an estimate. So the bounding function has to have a complexity also better than just doing TSP because I know I'm trying to get away from doing the remaining factorial work. So if I say that I'm working on n elements in general and I've got k elements to go, I could finish that by doing k factorial work. But if I can do k squared work or even k cubed work and decide, well, I don't want to do k factorial work, then I've got an add there. So here you say that the bounding function has to be less than or equal to reality, and it has to be faster than doing the remaining k factorial work. So for many virgin, for many values of k, k squared is better than k factorial. You have to get down to a pretty small k. It's around 3 or 4, right? That's when k squared, 3 squared is 9, 3 factorial is 6. All right, so if I get down to 3, then maybe I might just want to do factorial work. But for anything higher than 3... 
we're talking 4 factorial is 24, but 4 squared is just 16. So I'm still going to prefer uh, a k squared when k is 4 or larger. All right. This question here, I already answered. What method can we find to connect my lowest cost k vertices in k squared time? MST. So here's what this looks like. I'm going to put this all together now, graphic format. I've got these A, B, C, D, E, F, G. This is different points now. I'm trying to connect them all in a TSP. And this picture is right in the middle of it. So far, I've identified a partial path. I'm thinking, what if I go A to B to C? Is that worth trying to extend? Well, let me figure out what my estimate would be. My estimate would be involving me connecting all of these other points. So if I connect these points like this, see, that's the absolute cheapest way I can connect D, E, F, and G. And then I need to connect that as well to my current path. And the cheapest way to do that is with the shortest possible edges. That is clearly not a Hamiltonian cycle. However, that is the cheapest possible way I could connect A, B, C, D, E, F, and G with the current starting path of A, B, C. So then what I'm asking is, is that cheap enough? Because if that's cheap enough, it might be worth trying to extend the ABC solution. If that is too expensive, then the reality is, as I sort of untie this collision here at D and turn it into a real Hamiltonian cycle, it just gets longer. If I remove this C to D edge in favor of CG, because now I'm not having more intersections at D, I say, well, that's longer because the CD edge is shorter than the CG edge. So, if I make a true Hamiltonian cycle out of this, it's just going to get longer than what I've got. So I'm okay with having something that's not really a Hamiltonian cycle for my estimate. Because if, as this MST combination, it's too long, then the real Hamiltonian cycle would only be even longer. So as I refer to this throughout the rest of the next set of office hours over the next week or so, We'll be talking about this as the current path. These are the unvisited vertices. I make some MST on the unvisited vertices, and then I'm going to connect the unvisited vertices to the current path. And I call those things the arms, right? And the arms have to go to the beginning and end of the current partial path. Right? They have to go to the beginning and end. Because I know I'm already going to choose A, B, C in exactly that order. All I need to do is say, well, B is already fully done. It's got an in and an out. C has an in but no out. A has an out but no in. So I need to connect the arms to the closest point in the unvisited. Right? And the beginning and end of the current path. In this particular example, we've shown it that it's possible for them to go to the same point. It's not necessary for them to go to the same point. The goal of the arms is to find the closest point in the unvisited to the beginning. So the closest point to A and the closest point to C. In this example, it happens to be the same point. But if it's two different points, it's okay. If it's the same point, it's also okay. But you're not trying to find the one point that is closest to both of them. You're trying to find the one point that is closest to each of them, and it's okay if it's the same point. All right? I see that over and over again in office hours. We're going to try to fix that one too. So we start out by connecting these unvisited nodes together. I've done that. You see these gray lines. This is my MST. I've got the black lines. This is my current path, current path length. And then the next step is I've got to find the cheapest way to connect the unvisited to the partial tour. And that partial tour has only openings at the beginning and ending of the partial tour. So there I've got the blue lines, the black lines, and the gray lines. I add all that up and say this is my lower bound estimate. If that estimate is already too long, then A, B, C is a bad start. All right. If I haven't done anything so far, you might imagine I might have my current best might be infinity. So obviously this is going to be better than that. But if I've got some other numeric value of 
of this that I'm going to try to uh, beat. Uh, I think this is an optimal start anyway. So I think ABC would not be better than the best I've had so far. So if my best wasn't infinity, if I had some way to find something that already worked, then I think I would be comparing the blue, blue plus gray plus black to that. And if it was too long, I would say it's not promising. If it's not too long, then I'd say that it is promising. So here's my general form of branch and bound. It's going to look pretty similar to what we've seen before. I've got a, the three things that I had before. I've got promising, I've got a solution check, and I've got some iterated solution extension there. As I said, branch and bound is just backtracking with an additional constraint. And we see now we've got a conditional, the additional constraint is represented by me passing the current best or making the current best available to the promising function. Because the promising function is going to see if this node violates any constraints. And if it does, it definitely throws it away. But it's also going to see, well, what is the cost of using this if that's not better than the current best? Then it's also not promising. So now promising needs to know more information. It needs to know uh, about the, the constraint violations and it also has to know how to estimate what's going to be uh, the remaining and what the current best is to be able to, to, to do additional pruning. So we've got the solution check. That one's similar. <sighs> Here in update, right? Before I was doing a let's print out the solution. Um, in this case, I don't just print out the solution because I've got to go through all of them, right? And so I'm going to update the current best if I've gotten to a promising solution, right? Because the only way that I can get to a promising solution is if it's better than my current best, right? It either is going to fail at promising or is going to fail at solution if it's not a full solution that's better than my best. So my update is going to do something to change my current best. And it might be sort of keeping track of what that value is. It might also include keeping track of what that actual path looks like. I need to know what the weight of it is, but I also have to print out the answer in the end. So if I don't keep track of it in a way that I can print it later, then I won't be able to show my answer in the end. So now I've got this update function. If a new solution is better than the current solution, then update, right? The only way, so the if isn't part of update, right? If I get to update, I know that I've got a new solution and it's better than the current solution. So the if is really part of either solution or promising, right? Got this lower bound now. The lower bound is an estimate of the solution that's based on my cost so far. That's my current path length plus whatever it's going to take to do the rest. And in this case, it's talking about the MST and the arms. So the estimate of the cost so far, this is the black on the previous slide. And the underestimate of the cost remaining, this is the blue plus gray. Oh, that's a G. Believe me, it is. Right? So that's what lower bound is. That's the estimate of the solution. I don't have to do all the work to get the solution, but I can estimate what, what it would be. Promising, of course, <clears throat> we're trying to figure out if the lower bound is less than the current best. If it's not, we prune. All right, the key to branch and bound, of course, is the bound. We can get smarter and smarter on bound. We can do more and more work. As long as the calculation doesn't become prohibitive, I'm okay. Remember, I have to make sure that I don't over prune. Because if I, if I make this estimate and I'm just aggressive, I say, well, what if, it, it could cost more than that. But if I make an estimate that's now greater than reality, I say, oh, that looks terrible. It looks like it's going to cost me 500 miles, when in reality, it's a lot closer than that. So uh, if my estimate my my estimate is too long, I end up pruning out the solution, right? The optimal. If my estimate is too short, then I just say, oh, yeah, that one looks good. I'll try that one. Well, that one looks good. I'll try that one too. Ah, that looks good. I'll try that. And how many times do you say that? You say that factorial times and you end up taking too long. So the key to the the branch and bound is the bound. We want that as smart as possible. We want to do some work on there and we're realizing that the trade-off that we're spending on the complexity of that bound function is so that we don't have to do factorial work. Here is your project four. Whatever you do, do not copy and paste this out of the PDF. Just don't do it. 
It's available on Canvas. You go into the file section as a text file for those of you who are too lazy to type out these 14 lines. I suggest that it's better to type out the 14 lines and understand them line at a time than it is to copy and paste other code regardless of who provides it for you. This version of Generate Permutations, uh, Gen Perms, is a little different than the one that we saw in the previous version. The one we saw in the previous version back when we were talking about stacks and queues were pushing on and popping off of the fronts and backs and tops of stacks and queues. This version uses swap, which is slightly faster, and um, it's still going to do the same thing, however. So use this version of it. You see that this is a full setup branch and bound algorithm. It's got the elements, right? Here is my solution check. Is perm length equal to path size? Is the number of things in my permutation equal to the total number of things? If my permutation has all the things, that is the completed path, right? So there's my solution check. Here's my promising check. This is given the path so far and this current perm length, right? So I've got these five items out of a possible 10. Is that promising? If these five items are in this particular order, is that promising? If no, then I quit. If yes, then I try to extend the solution. So here's my iterated solution extension. I'm going to go through all of the things that are remaining from perm length to the end of the path size and try to swap them into place. Right? I swap them in and say, well, if I've tried one, two, what comes after one, two? Well, what if I try three after that? One, two, three. If that's good, I'll move forward. One, two, three, four. But if one, two, three fails, I'm going to try to swap three out with something else. And so I'll swap one, two, and I'll swap three and four. So I'll say, well, what about one, two, four? Is one, two, four good? If one, two, four works and I try to extend the solution, one, two, four, three, or one, two, four, five, right? If one, two, four fails, then I swap four away and try to put something else in there. I'll say one, two, five. And so that's the very confusing part about this particular piece of code is the swapping nature of this iterated recursion. <clears throat> we keep trying new things, right? And what I come up with is some vector that's got my path in it. So let's say I've got these six different things that I'm choosing, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If I've got a perm length of 2, Right? That's perm length 2. That means that these two things are my permutation that I'm currently building. And the other four things are not quite in the permutation. right? And so as we try to extend the permutation, I'm trying to say, well, I want to find something that's three digits long. And this for loop goes through the process of trying 0, 1, 2. It swaps it over here with 3 so that I can try 0, 1, 3. Then it puts the 2 and 3 back, and then it swaps the 2 and 4, so I can try 0, 1, 4. Then when that's done, it swaps the 4 back, and then it tries to put the 5 in place, 0, 1, 5. And every time I do that, I try to extend the solution by calling gen perms with a longer permutation length. So here my perm length was 2. I try to swap something into this position right here, and then call it with a perm length of 3. That's what this function does. It's pretty complicated because we just don't think that way generally in our normal thought processes. So my suggestion is to just take this piece of code as is, put something that's really simple that every time you get into gen perms, sort of print the perm length, uh, print the path, and just see what that is. See how this function works. Just, just do nothing other than a simple driver that calls gen perms and do it something with a small number like six or you know, eight is going to be a fairly large amount of printing there. But if you do that, you'll see how gen perms works. Because if you don't understand gen perms, you're not going to be able to apply it to solve project four, right? Promising is where we're going to do our work here. Uh, you might make four or five lines changed or additions to this. All of the work is really going to be done in promising. The four or five things here are going to be, what do I do something? Because remember that if I'm in here, I've got a solution. Not only a solution, it's a promising solution, right? This is, this is me for, well, I guess it's not necessarily a promising solution. It's a solution. I can check to see if it's the best solution so far. It's definitely a promising solution, but it might not be the best solution so far. So when I'm in here, I've got a new solution 
that hasn't violated any constraints all the way up to the last position. Hasn't gone too expensive all the way up to the last position. But I don't know after I've added the very last edge, is it too expensive? So that's where do something with the path comes into place. You have to figure out if this actually is the best you've seen. And if it is, I need to save it for later because when I'm done with everything, I need to print it. So that's where the do something is. All right. That's hitting my summary slide there. Knowing what branch and bound is, we're going to prune the search pace when I'm working on optimization problems. I was already, already pruning when I was violating constraints. Now I'm pruning to get an optimal solution as well. I need to keep some current best solution. And in this case, since we're minimizing, I'm always going to have to do some upper bound getting shorter and shorter and shorter until the end, the upper bound has my best answer. My lower bound is estimating everything else. And if the lower bound is too expensive, meaning it's more than the upper bound, if the lower bound is an estimate that's less than it will actually cost, if that still is too expensive, throw it away. All right, there's my black screen. So let's get ourselves over to this end queens code. I said I was going to check it out. Some nice screen recursion there, but I'll pull this one up here. So here is Canvas. You see I'm in the files section. I'm also in uh, this, uh, where I get to files, I show up here, sample code, and there's end queens, right? So you click on that, you download it. Looks like that. I'm gonna save this thing here and then hop over to VS Code and jump into that. So for here, jump into that. Let's do a tar nectar and queens. Queens and minus F and Queens and tar.gz. All right, so there I go. I've got that, and then I can also do a code minus A of and Queens. That's good there. And I'll put this thing away. And there's my files, right? So here's my driver. That's what nQueen's demo file does. You see it's got main in it. And what it does is it's got a little loop here to ask you uh, to give me the number of queens you'd like to solve for and if you want the results all printed. If, if you say no to printing the results, it doesn't actually print the chess boards. It just gives you some statistics. So it always gives you some statistics, but this version will also let you display results as well. Right? So... Here's the heart of the solution. It's this end queens object. <clears throat> Silence. This end queens object, and I create a board of size n. I solve the board, and then I print some stuff. It's a pretty simple driver. Let's look at end queens.h. There's my class description of this end queens class. The things that we talked about in the earlier lecture slides. Here's where n gets stored. The size of the board. I've got this list of solutions, or this long, long that tells me how many solutions that I found, how many branches I've tried. I'll use that for statistics later. Then I've got this position in row. That's my vector of integers that lets me know where I've placed something in every row. And here are my three bool vectors, the column availability and left and right diagonal availability. Just like we talked about in the lecture slides, um, I've redefined this static const here i'm calling bool available just so i can say available is something that i can use as a true or false there and it just makes the code a little bit easier to read that's all that's done there i've got a put queen call that's the one we looked at and promising of course and then this nifty little ascii printing thing that does display of boards all right so that's what's going on there let's look at the implementation it's pretty much as discussed earlier here here's and queens my constructor it says create the board i need to set the size in i set the solutions and the number of solutions tried to zero 
and I build these available matrices, right? So I set all of the position in rows to negative one, meaning I haven't placed anything in those rows. I never check those because I don't need to. I just check the availability. And when I get done, the things in there are, are correct. So it doesn't really matter what those are. I never look at them unless I'm printing them in the end. But here's my vector of n booleans. That's the availability there. And we said that our diagonal sizes were going to be 2 times n minus 1. So that's gave me 7 left diagonals and 7 right diagonals in my 4x4 four four case. And you can see, well, if I do an 8x8, eight eight, then I'll just have 15 left and right diagonals and one 8 size boolean for columns. All right. Solve just starts by calling put queen. There's the start of recursion. Start by putting a queen in the zeroth row and display says yes or no to print them. There's the promising we looked at. If the column and left and right diagonals are available, then this is a promising placement. There's put queen. You can work through all of this code. I strongly suggest you do. Make sure you understand a solution of this type. Play with it. Do some printing. Understand the tough part about understanding this code is still the recursion inside of iteration. Understand why we have to fill in these true values because we placed a piece. But then after we place it, we're done trying that. We've returned and say, well, unplace that piece. That's really what we're doing. We say we're going to try to place the piece and then move forward. Once I've gotten done placing the piece, I'm going to move backwards. And so this is allowing me to do backtracking here. All right, so I am at the compile step here, right? So let's get that back here and say G++ minus I should do that. Um, let's go with uh, minus C and Queens. Where are we? Oh, we're in the wrong file. That's what it is. So that's where we need to be. There we go. That's why compilation wouldn't happen. What do we have there? We've got some files compiled there. I've got an A dot out. If I wanted to, I could come back here and say minus O and Queens. It gives me a nice executable called n queens here, right? There it is. Dot slash n queens. Enter the number of queens. All right. Let's try four. We know what this looks like. Display results, yes or no? Sure. Let's see those results. And there we go. I see here that... I can take this all the way up. Make that a little smaller. And I see that I did this. I found the two solutions. There were two solutions. I ended up looking at 60 different branches explored out of 256, which ends up as me not doing all 256 work. I actually saved over 75% of the work by doing pruning. Right? That's what backtracking gave me, the pruning. All of the work was 256, but this case it was less. So... Let's try in queens again. Let's take it up a notch. Sure, let's look at 10. 5. So 5 gives me 10 solutions, right? And here they all are. You can see, look, in, look inside there. You can see there's an embedded sort of solution to 4. Um, but it turns out there's 10 solutions for a 5 by 5, 220 branches explored out of 3,000 and more. So a savings of almost 93%. We keep turning things up here. Let's go to six. Sure, we'll look at them. Strangely enough, there's fewer solutions for six than there was for five. All right. There's only four solutions. But we found those four solutions after looking at 894 branches out of more than 45,000 branches. So our savings are upwards of 98% now. You can see that the, the higher up we get, the more we end up actually pruning. So... Um, we'll do the eight queen. So just so you're <clears throat> happy with it. We said earlier there was going to be 16 million different choices and we're going to come up with 92 solutions. I'll print those 92 solutions. Things scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. There they are. But in the end, you see that I found those 92 solutions after 15,000 
explorations out of that one point or 16 million right so my savings is looking like 99.9 percent it's probably the last one i'm going to print just because it's beyond being interpretable but we can go higher and say after nine queens i can find 352 solutions with a savings of 99.98 percent that's good 10 queens no printing find 724 solutions saving over 99.99 percent that's pretty good let's jump it up a notch how about 14 queens now we're really going to get some pausing right because this is what's going through a lot of work here right um this is going to take a few seconds but we'll get it there we go we just found 365 solutions to placing 14 queens and what's so great about backtracking is, look at that savings. A savings of 100%. Success! That is a perfectly efficient algorithm. It cost absolutely nothing. Well, we know that. It took more time than nothing. But this is what happens when we have rounding error, right? So uh, approximation of floating points here gives me a savings of 100%. That's a lot of fun. But we did avoid... Something like 1.1 times 10 to the 16th possible permutations. That's, I think, literally bajillions. And we found that after looking at, you know, mere hundreds of millions of actual branches. So that's nice, right? If I go longer than this, it's just going to take me off. But uh, I'll try one and maybe after lunch I'll have an answer. All right, let's get food.